Okay, Serena De La Haye, artist and uh, willow maker. That would, that would be all right, yes. Artist is a nice open t okay. you know, terminology for anything that goes, really. Uh, so can you just tell me a little bit of uh, uh, what that involves and what you do? What does it involve? Well, that's a, that's a changing uh, thing, really, and each year seems to bring up what I call its own particular recipes. But principally, I've been working in Willow now for about 18 years. I started after I left art college. I started because it was my local uh, material. It was on my doorstep. There was a lot of it at the time that was also extremely cheap to use, and it enabled me to work fairly freely on a scale that otherwise I perhaps wouldn't have been able to achieve um, in other means. I started in a field next to my parents' house with a, an arc welder and a pair of secateurs. And actually, principally, I suppose it hasn't greatly changed from that. Um, I now have a shed, <laughs> I didn't call it that. Um, and occasionally I get to work indoors or outdoors, depending on the nature of the commission. Um, so, um, for instance, two years ago I went to Stornoway and worked outside for a couple of weeks on a piece of work and then a few weeks later I was in my workshop making a commission piece for someone's garden. So mm -hmm. it, it's great, you get the variety. So were you always interested in uh, art? Were you very arty as a, as a child at school? Yes, I was. I, I had specific memories of winning competitions, um, drawing competitions. Um, which made me remarkably unpopular with my friends, which is wasn't very nice. Aren't people horrible to you when you're a kid? Um, uh, and uh, so that, that kind of set the tone. And I think when I was about 16, when at the time I was choosing my O-levels, there was obviously that ongoing debate about whether I was going to obviously do something that was deemed as sensible or, or possibly art-orientated. But it was very fixed at that point that I was going to art college at 16 um, because that's what I could do and wanted to do. So which art college was that? Was that in England? Yes, Falmouth. Falmouth Art College. I think it's now called um, something slightly different, but it's a much bigger place. At the time, it was quite a small college um, and very much principally concerned with uh, making. The, it was what I'd call it old school. So there were sculptors and painters in the truest sense working mm. there, um, partly because we were so remote as well at the time. Um, I think you were left in your shed to get on with it. So was it at Falmouth that you uh, discovered Willow, or did you uh, put your hand to, to all sorts of uh, medium? I used Willow at Falmouth, yes I did, because I remember taking it down with me from uh, uh, after a holiday, packed it into the back of a mini, and, and, and stormed down to, to Cornwall for, um, for a term and used it. I, I think the reaction within the college, actually, with the tutors and things, wasn't particularly positive, if I remember correctly. Um, so I abandoned it fairly quickly. And it wasn't until I left art college and um, was setting up my own practice at home that I decided that I would turn back to, to using the willow. And that is basically why I've, you know, I'm still doing it, because it's still outside my back door and it's still something I enjoy using. Um, it's fantastic material. So would you uh, consider using anything else or is, is Willow uh, uh, always, always your medium that you're going to use? Have you ever experimented um, with any other, um, uh, uh, anything else but Willow? Uh, metal. Metal was my first love actually at college. Um, uh, I used to be found in the uh, metal department thrashing away at bits of corrugated iron and, and welding bits of pieces. And actually that did uh, also lead to the path to willow in a way because I started off making metal frameworks in which the, the willow was woven on and it gave me a flexibility of form. It also made, I mean, I could transport the pieces easily. Um, uh, and yeah, it was just a, a means to an end, um, but I followed a lot of metal sculptors in the early days, like Anthony Caro and uh, David Smith. Uh, they, they were the people that, uh, Richard Serra, these are big uh, artist names, uh, you, you know, that very male established uh, as well. Um, so that, uh, again, was the reason why I went back to or turned to Willow, because it was something I could do quite quickly. It was cheap. Um, there wasn't anyone actually, there was no prescription how to use it, in a sense. There were, you know, people been using Willow for centuries and making effigies out of them, but actually in terms of an art form or a, cr a craft, whichever people like to call it now, it, there was nothing going on at the time I started it. So I had this wonderful open possibility of, of ideas and things I could do. So your, your willow sculptures, you say, uh, internally are made from metal. All your sculptures, do they have to have uh, like a metal structure inside it? 
or can you just create uh, willow pieces without having that um, that defined uh, internal? I think structure. the metal thing makes the pieces my own because they they seem to uh, you know like anyone who's you know becomes more established with what they do you you create a signature for yourself or a style I suppose um, unconsciously I suspect but it, it's there so if you put my work next to anyone else working in Willow you can definitely tell the difference between the two different uh, makers. Um, have I used, I don't use um, uh, steel frameworks all the time. If it's a structural thing, I'll often use willow itself or um, some other means of holding the willow up. And the piece that I mentioned earlier that I made in Stornoway was purely made out of willow, um, just different gradings of willow. The trouble with willow is it ine inevitably falls apart. And part of the um, commission work that I've done over the years um, by putting an internal framework in it, it gives it that certainly internal strength um, and makes it m much more likely to survive against the rigours of, of nature. And it's just the way that I've built my work up and my repertoire, so it could change next week. Okay. <laughs> so you, say, you talk about um, willow beer is a natural product and it does, it, uh, I suppose, decays after a certain amount of time. So do you go back to your sculpture and um, sort of titivate it, if you like? Do you sort of put it back together again? Or is it a sort of a natural progression? And, and the person that has asked you to, you know, to commission your, this piece, um, do you sort of say at the beginning, you know what, after a few years' time, it's not going to look quite like this? Mm. And is that part of, you know, of the contract, in a way, that you do return to the, the piece? And... Um, and keep making it new again, if you like. Well, it's a practical, again, it's, I'm afraid it's a very practical um, uh, sort of solution to the thing, often that the pieces do just disintegrate, because uh, the nature of the, the commission work is, as you said, that I go, I go and make the piece of work, or I make a piece and it, it's delivered to the door of the, the, uh, the client. But it's, it's made very clear that, that they only have perhaps a 10 year plus lifespan. Maybe that's part of the reason why they want the piece or like the piece, that it has that transitory nature and it's going to evolve and change. The, the work will disintegrate very rapidly after about five years if it's not um, maintained. And the bigger pieces of work, I often do go back and, and uh, not, not you know, sort of patch it up, basically, just fill in the areas that have been mostly weathered. Smaller pieces generally just, just the time just disintegrates because it's not actually... It's quite difficult to, um, again, the practical thing of being a commission-based artist is that unless it's built into the commissioning process, you often have to let those go for financial things because people do not want to spend ongoing finances to it. Um, but it could be argued equally that the nature of the work is such that they should be allowed to evolve um, and there is no pretension about um, trying to preserve them in that sense. Um, it, there is no solution to that unless you then did the opposite of what you're doing, which is basically using a natural material and clunking it with chemicals. But, you know, that is not the reason why the work is made, in a sense. Um, the rest of the, the commission work or the longer, bigger public pieces, it's an ongoing story. There, is, there has been no real answer to how to deal with it. The, the Willow Man on the M5 is now 10 years old. And I'm now looking at a temporary repair on, on again, the areas that have been most weathered. But the question at this point is, does he stay or does he go? Um, because, you know, essentially it's a temporary piece. Um, but because it become, has become a public art piece that's reasonably popular or very popular in some people's eyes, it, the question is, do you then try and maintain that and sustain the piece of work? And then how long can you do that, realistically? So you have been back to the Willow Man. Yeah. And... Um, uh, Added some more willow, mm. and um, so uh, tell me a bit about the the willow man because um, you're very famous in this area in Somerset for that piece, and millions of people see mm -hmm. this structure on the M5. Um, who came to you in the first place? Well, who whose commission is that? It was commissioned by the Arts Council. Um, the Arts Council in 2000 had a, a, a you know, a nationwide uh, project to, to bring art into the, into the public arena. Um, some of that was through uh, a, a grant applications and some of it was directly approached to the artists and I was lucky enough to be directly approached by the, 
the, the Arts Council who were actually running um, from Exeter at the time. It was, it's a South West um, branch of the Arts Council. And they asked me to produce a local piece of work using local material. And they gave me um, a, the, a span on the motorway to look at, to put the piece of work. It was decided that obviously if they could get it next to the motorway, this piece of work would be obviously as visual as anything you could produce. It would also be instantly in the public arena and it would uh, obviously um, be appealing to the public going past. Um, well, you know, it's, it's an interesting when you look back, all those sort of kind of lines get diffused over time. But um, as, a, as a commission, I was working with, you know, fairly specific uh, criteria in that sense, but it actually, um, uh, and a budget. But I then actually managed to, um, you know, expand on that a little bit. I found a, a space that was um, empty. Um, I found a farmer who was willing to put the piece of work on the land, um, and I, I, you know, I was able to create the piece of work in in, in a space that's really quite extraordinary. And at the time, they were trying to get a nationwide sort of appeal of arts right across the, you know, the spectrum of arts um, out into the public arena. So take it away from the galleries and make it more accessible. They asked me to produce a piece of work that was local, using local material, and they gave me this span of the motorway, and I can remember going up and down the motorway with them, looking at potential sites. The criteria for uh, otherwise was fairly open. I mean, I had a budget, um, and I was basically left to come up with, uh, you, know, the, you know, the space and the idea um, within all these, that small criteria. Um, and at the time, it, you thought help but actually it was brilliant because there was a complete open sort of you know page of what I could do with the with, with the work so I was left basically to sort it out myself. To date I own the work unusually because the commissioners um, so at, at the time handed the the work over to me um, partly because of the fact that where it was sited along the motorway and the liability issues with it. Um, so that, that's where it all kind of began and as you have probably noted the, the story has constantly evolved about the site and it's now um, got a, a rather large and slightly controversial development around it um, that involved housing and, and, and commercial. Um, so what do you feel about that because there is a huge development happening behind him, a nice I'm, green backdrop. So well, the work, the, the, in terms of pure aesthetics or the idea behind the work, and, you, and you know, the inspiration behind the work was to produce this dynamic piece of work that sat in it, the landscape. The landscape was never a pure landscape, hence the reason it was able to build it there and put it there. Um, so I was aware of that, but it was visible from the motorway and from the rail on the other side, but never to be approached by foot, because obviously it was it, partly it was protected as much as anything, but it was very much to be seen by a person in a car or in a train. Um, so suddenly now this development's there, and, and it has basically reduced the, the, that, that it, that's not the impact of him, because he was never large, but it's reduced the scale of what potentially he is in a way. He's um, he's shrunk because there's too much around him to to you know set off, and he looks forty foot now rather than this dynamic piece in the landscape. And that was essentially the the the, the purest idea that, that 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 drove the work. It was natural, and it was in it was in the landscape in which the material came. Um, and it was figurative and it, you know, it looked slightly out of Congress against the motorway, but equally it sort of kind of seemed to fit at the same time. Now, then, he's just become a piece of work that's, I, I, it's very difficult to describe, sandwiched. but it's, it, it, yes, he's sandwiched, that was a very good but way to describe in it. In a way, I'm just trying to think, it might not necessarily be a bad thing, because it's kind of, you know, this beautiful, natural piece of work in between a motorway mm. and uh, an industrial estate, really. Well, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's kind part of, of the story of the Willow Man. Because yes. it was never straightforward. The moment he was in the ground and he was vandalised within nine months, the, the kind of the story evolved. He was on farmland that in, even in those days was in a changing landscape. The farmer um, sold up his dairy herd. It was, at the, it was the foot and mouth. You know, there's a lot of changes going on within that, and then almost symbolic of all those changes. Again, they're very subtle, and they're probably only you know relevant to the people actually directly involved with it. The, the farmland was sold, or was in the process of being sold, 
So it could be argued that, that you know the reason he's there was because this was obviously slowly out there and it was happening, and it's only recently, obviously, within the, the terms of the, the planning that I've been aware of what's going to happen, and I've obviously responded to that. Um, but I'm afraid the Willow Man has not powerful enough sway to stop major development and the name all in the name of progress. Um, and and it, and I then have been uh, have been able to take it on as a possibility that it may be, as you said, a positive thing. Uh, partly because of the ongoing issue with maintenance. This all has to be self-funded and self-motivated, so there's a possibility that I'll be able to approach the developers, certainly on the short term. In terms of the longer term, there's a bigger issue anyway, not least of all, obviously, because it's a natural material, but obviously how to deal with something that's now become a popular art piece. Um, my, my only concern is that it will lose the relevance that has sustained it um, because of obviously this enormous great big uh, in a regional development building by Morrison's but it's an ongoing story and I haven't got all the answers yet and I'm hoping that those will come as time goes on. As we know uh, the world is ever-changing and um, children, at school, children at school are sort of uh, being pushed towards a more um, computerised um, outlook and uh, sort of pressurised in a way to, to take that, um, that uh, path. You're an artist and uh, what do you feel about uh, going into to schools and sort of relaying your, um, your way of thinking which is obviously very different, it's uh, you know, a natural creative hands-on kind of thing. Do you go into schools and uh, sort of preach your art if you like? No, I never preach. I don't. Well, I think it's a very difficult thing to do. It, it has to be part of of, of the, the the developing curriculum within a school anyway. Because otherwise, it has no relevance. You just get sort of piloted into schools. You turn up for a day. You do something. So it's often built in, whether it's um, uh, an environmental message or or just purely uh, was they just about form or sculptural qualities that they're exploring. Um, <laughs> The only thing I can say is that I think it's still fundamentally extremely important that pe uh, people do things with their hands, whether they uh, become computer literate or not. Um, uh, I think it's very important uh, th that they ha experience it, um, at least of all to decide that they don't like it. Um, Children don't have um, accessibility outside spaces. They don't have um, accessibility to be imaginative. They don't have. They don't. They haven't learned to spend time just fiddling with a, you know, the simplest of things, a stick and a bit of mud. Um, I I have yet to to fully understand this. My, you know, in terms of my own practice and relating to education, but. Um, I fundamentally think that you just need to get your hands dirty occasionally and just have a go. Um, I work with children now that um, find it very difficult to tie things. These are very simple processes that, again, are not going to you know solve world issues. But I think you know th these are just things that people should be able to do. They have to apply themselves in a certain way. They have to see things in a three-dimensional way. They're working on a scale that they perhaps wouldn't normally work in. They're working outside often. Um, we can and move inside but we're principally outside. Um, it's a learning about a local material, it's environmental uh, uh, issues regarding using natural materials, sustainable materials. So there's a hundreds and one messages on it but I think just being outside, you know, feeling a bit of willow between your fingers and, and understanding what you're dealing with just there on that day is, you know, just you can't replace it with any form of education really. Um, and it often is appealing to people that find it difficult in school so it's quite quite an interesting thing to just to just to develop and see what you can do in schools